Elephant Man Podcast Network, grown man conversations, dealing with elephants in the room. What's going on? It's your man, DB. Like, subscribe, share, hit the notification bell so you can know when new material is coming out. Like, subscribe, and share. All right. What's going on, everybody? What's going on, family? Give you all some time to get up in here. Salute. Shalom, brothers. We're supposed to have our brother in the building. Uh, trying to contact him now. <laughs> You know, my brother's real busy. Dr. Ron Shields, uh, Kingdom Harbinger Ministries, supposed to be on tonight. So we're trying to figure out where he at, what's going on, make sure hey, hopefully everything is, we pray, pray everything is okay. Um, if you haven't seen the the last episode, but I, but I have I have brother uh, Karis and Robert on there, combo with Karis and Robert. They took it down off of Facebook. I'm sorry, off of YouTube. Because I had showed a video clip from another uh, from Viacom, uh, but you know, they, so I guess it went went to get some copyright law. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut that out and then reload it and resubmit it. Shalom, shalom, Mr. Black Tastic. Shalom, brother. It's always good to hear from you. See, see you, brother. You know, uh, I'm about to get you on my, my on, on my next series too, brother. It's on my heart to talk about um, the judges. The judges, okay. So we, it's like the end of when when uh, J uh, Joshua had died. He lived. He lived 110 years, and I I was reminded of that when I got to the end of Joshua, Joshua 23 and Joshua 24. But the Most High was with Joshua and the children of Israel the whole time um, that he was with. Um, uh, he was he uh, obeyed the laws and the different statutes and stuff like that, and so. Um, but then it's a, a turn. It was a turn for the worst, man. Man, we've been, it's been just be stuff always happening, man. We just so hard headed, man. Stiff neck people. So it, it turned for the worst. And um, then he had to send the judges out, man. So I'm going to break down each book of the judges one by one and uh, get your insight on this one of those two, one or two things, uh, brother, um, brother Black Tastic. So, uh, but I'll call you, man. I'll call you. In the building, we have my brother, Divine Prospect. What's going on? Salute, shalom, brother. Oh, what? I can't hear. See, internet, I can't hear. It's probably my stuff, man. Hey, what's going on? I don't, I don't hear you, brother. It came in and out. I can't hear. Can you hear me, uh, brother, uh, Dr. Ryan? Okay. But dang, I don't know why. Well, I can't hear you. Huh. Okay. Yeah, bro, bro, bro like that. So we'll, we'll see what's going on, man. Sh shalom to Shalita51. Shalom, shalom. Shalom to Black Tastic. Rillian T. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Good to see you guys. Uh, still don't hear it. So I don't know what happened. Your browser has lost connection. Really? Can you all hear me, guys? Shalom, Sean Harris. Where is my camera? Dr. Ron, can you hear me right now? Okay, so now something happened to my camera. All right. Father, in the name of Yahweh Shah, we thank you. And we bind the hand of the enemy right now. Hold on, guys. I'm trying to figure out why my camera just went black. Fade to black. I don't know what's going on. Oh. Huh. Camera just went fade to black. Oh. And I still can't hear you, Dr. Ryan, so I don't know what's going on with that. Might have to log off and then log back on. Oh, wow. They like to play games. Why did you say that at Christian Magic? <laughs> I heard you say that on the show. I was cracking up, man. Oh, wow. That's never happened. Well, I, my camera don't want to work. Huh. 
But we're going to keep rolling. We're going to keep rolling. We're going to keep rolling. So, Dr. Ryan, you might have to log off and then log back on because I, I still can't hear. <sighs> yeah. So, type of one, if you can hear me, my camera just went out. Like, I promise. My camera just went out like it never happened. I got to. Sorry, guys. I don't know what's going on. Bear with me. Wow. Bear with me. So even if you can't, what's up? What's going on? TK Y'all Bank, Shalawan family, Shalawan, Shalawan, TK Y'all Bank. Yeah, we had Dr. Ron Shields on tonight. Uh, I couldn't hear him, but he could hear me. And uh hopefully you all you all can hear me. But just all of a sudden my camera just went out and I'm trying to get it back. Nevertheless, if you can't see me and you see my elephant, then that's fine. As long as you can hear Dr. Ron, because I got a few questions. I asked him if he's back in. Let me see. Can I get him back in? Hello? Shalom, shalom. Shalom. Now I can hear you, but I can't see me. <laughs> yeah, I can't see you either. <laughs> Do you see the elephant icon? Yeah. Oh, man. How, how's it going today? Uh, not too bad. I, I was having a lot of um, technical difficulties just trying to, I don't know what happened today. This is a weird day, man. Just all yeah. these technical issues I was having trying to get logged in. Um, and then while I was trying to get everything set up, I saw the email coming from you. I'm like, oh, I was like, man, you know, let me hurry up and try to get everything working. And as soon as I get on, my audio is not working, you know, and then I saw some glitching on your end with your video. I'm like, what's going on? This is weird. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna keep on working on my camera throughout this whole whole ordeal but uh glad you can join us and congratulations on 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 getting the doctoral ship uh what what school did you what school did you uh go to uh the hebraic institute of theology um out here in atlanta georgia oh man that's awesome that's yes, really, really awesome. The, um, university that was established um by a um professor uh or doctor of ministry uh who was uh over the congregation we used to fellowship with out here and he was telling me for a while that he was working on creating an institute, a collegiate institute for our community and anybody else outside our community, but primarily for our community. Um, and he told me this about five something years ago. Um, and then he finally got it up and running about three years ago um, and started to enroll and, uh, you know, divvy out degrees to people who took the courses, et cetera. Got one accreditation, working on the second accreditation. Um, and then asked me would I be interested in um, partaking in the doctor of theology. Um, now, you know, initially I was not interested in doing any of that um, okay. at all at a secular university. Um, and I told him, I said, look, you know, my concept is autonomy. We have to create resources for ourselves, right? Whether that's an institute, whether that's products, goods, services, whatever the case may be. And when I realized this was something that was made for us by our own community, I said, oh, let's do it. Um, so he asked me how many college credits I had. I told him it was equivalent to almost like a master's degree. So he said, I could roll you in to the doctor degree. You know, it's going to take okay. some time. You know, it's going to be some requirements asked of you. I said, okay, let's do it. So um, I did, you know, what I, when, you know, what I was required of me. And then in June uh, last month, they had the ceremony on June 6th and I got my degree. Right now, they're just settling out all the paperwork, which should be done um, no later than September. And then from there, everything will be official, official, you know. Um, wow. Yeah, man, that's powerful. That's powerful. I'm glad you said it about that time because you know I got my questions right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's why you never play, man. You always prepare, bro. <laughs> but I just like to say thank you, man. Thank yeah. you for joining me. I know you got a busy schedule, and I no told you st your staff was gonna keep it down to 70 minutes. Oh, he just left. <laughs> I had these uh these questions. I don't know what happened with that. The internet is acting crazy, but it's all good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, there you go. Coming back in, man. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and see you now. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what's going on. This hey, is... man, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. Yeah, let's see him going on. Yeah. Please. So, um, yeah, so I appreciate it. I told you, I told your staff I was going to have you no more than 70 minutes. So I'm not going not to keep you long. I just got a few questions, man. Stuff like that. First thing, though, that truth works. Mixtape volume three. Yes. Now, wait, wait, before you start. Yes, sir. Um, I need to share this link. So can you yes, post sir. the link in the chat? I'm just going to copy and paste it. Yes, sir. Do you see our chat, too? Can you be able to post it? 
Yeah, I can post it. Just give me one second. I have to yes, reach out. To, I got to reach out to a teammate of mine. Hold on one second. Uh, yes, sir. Shout out to everybody who tuned in. Like, subscribe, share. Hit the notification bell so you can know when um, new material is coming up. I'm going to close some of these other windows out so we won't have no conflict when we do this. Amen. Shalita 51, blessing to you. Tika Yabanks, blessings to you as well. Sean Harris, blessings to you again. And Mr. Black Tassic, black blessings to you as well, sir. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. All right. Make sure you share with other folk. Okay, he's 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 getting his gets getting the mod mod in there to be able to share the links. And that's what I was gonna say too. Yeah. Anything you can just get them to come in and share, share anything they need to share. Amen. Okay, no problem. So just give me one second. Mm -hmm. Um one second, and you dropped it in the chat, right? Brian Hearn, blessings to you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, okay, yes, yes. Did I drop one uh, in the chat? Did you? Did the, you the link, it? the link to the show. Oh, the link to the show. The YouTube okay. link to the show. Yeah, I could, so I could just copy and paste. All right, let's do that. Let's yeah, do that. I gotta get out. I might have some problems coming back in. So. Yeah, that's cool. Let's do that. Copy that. Link to the show. All right. There you go. Thanks. Chat. Should come up. Right, I said. Cool. That. that one right there. That's the YouTube one. It's also oh, being shown on Facebook. And uh, yep. I got you. Give me two minutes. Let's Brother Ron Hearns, what's going on, man? Good to hear you. And you know what, uh, Pastor Ron? When you see me in the parking lot uh, that day, I see you coming out of the store. You was like, what time does it come on? And that's a good question because <laughs> I don't have a set time. But I will get a set time when I start doing this series about judges. We're going to go through each judge and uh, just break it down. And uh, uh, so it's going to be probably Sunday afternoons, like 4, 4 p.m. Central or 5 p.m. Central. I just want to figure out. But it's going to be one of those two days uh, in the evening time. Um, so I'll be looking out for those. I really like that, uh, Wednesday at, uh, 845 central as well when the smoke clears or whatever, but I might have some other obligations going on with that. Also a master gardener's class is coming up. Master gardener's class is coming up. I'm going to be sharing information about that. Uh, elephant man, uh, growing and farm network, eat what you sow. Read what you grow. Read what you read what you sow. Eat what you grow. Let's go, and we got to make sure we grow our own food. I'm definitely gonna ask them some questions about that as well too. But we make sure we got to grow our own food. Harvest is coming up pretty good, you know. Um, peppers, they're coming up. Tomatoes, squash, um, different things like that. And uh, so, yes, if you guys don't have a green thumb, get with somebody who do have a green thumb. And get the growing. And also, there are also different things that you can use to grow on the inside. Like I stay up in Northwest Indiana, Chicago land area. So we got a short growing season. So it's from April, I want to say, until uh the middle of October, and then it starts getting real cold. None can really take the the snow and the slush except for collard greens, if you take care of them right uh outside. Uh pretty much in the raised bed because you can control the temperature of the of the, the soil. But other than that, man, we got a short growing season. And so we make sure that we try to um, get what, get in and get what we can. I think we 5A, get what we can in our growing season. But they have a hydroponics set up and they have an aquaponics set up as well. And um, so, but the hydroponics set up, you can be able to grow on the inside or at least start the seedlings on the inside and um, do the lettuces, uh, lettuces, if that's a word, uh, spinach, different things like that. So even though it's snowing outside, you still be able to get something going on herbs, medicinal herbs and stuff like that. Um, you, you, you ready, doctor? Uh, 30 seconds. Okay. <laughs> it's all good. 
because I thought you was twice. It's all good. Um, hey, can you hear me clearly? I can hear you clearly. I can see you clearly oh. now. All right, cool, cool. I don't know what was going on earlier. Yeah, it's crazy. It's strange. It's all crazy, but it's all good. So, yeah. So, uh, Black Tastic, what's going on with that air fry? You, <laughs> you growing anything? This you growing anything, brother? Type in the chat. Let me know if you growing something. All right. So. Make sure, make sure you subscribe, like, share. I'm gonna be putting his stuff in here too, as far as uh, uh, Divine's uh, website. I mean, uh, YouTube page in there. And congratulations on reading twenty five thousand. That's amazing. That's pretty amazing. You know, it's years and years of grinding. Okay, you can't tell. Mm -hmm. All right, I think I should be ready now. Okay. Uh, Copy this. Same one, and also don't forget tomorrow. Uh, Ashanda at Large, Sister Shonda at Large, is going to have um, the seven fourteen a movement when she launches the website on seven fourteen, of course. And uh, if you want to get more information on that, make sure you text eight three three five eight seven zero two one three. Text text Israelite to that number. And I'll leave that at the bottom of the screen. And she's going to start at, uh, I think, 10 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So make sure you join that tomorrow. She's going to have, we're going to have a prayer for, for Israel and be praying for, for the nations and praying for uh, the community and different things like that. And she's going to launch and introduce the site. Um, so that should be very, very good. Make sure you tune into that tomorrow. All right. All right. You ready, doctor? Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. My bad. We could have got that uh, taken care of a little bit better than that. But the first thing, question I want to ask you about is that Truth Works, Works mixtape, uh, volume three. Yes. Uh, are, are you doing Are you doing some rhyming on that album? <laughs> no, I'm not doing no rhyming on that album. Um, I, I, I mean, in the past, when I was younger, I used to be a rap artist. Um, I went by the different names, Hydro, Kilowatts, and stuff like that. And uh, me and a couple other brothers from my high school uh, created a group called the Starting Five. Um, this was like back in uh, 2000, 2000, 2000. Um, and um, we uh, was working to get on radio shows uh, to present our group and um, working on a, a deal. And um, unfortunately, everything fell through. Um, I was still doing songs and writing, but um, I think it was in 2009 when um, that gift really wasn't there like that anymore. You know, and at that time, that's when I was transitioning into Christianity, and then from there, transition to identifying as an Israelite. So um, people have been asking me because I did a couple of live streams a couple of years ago, about two years ago, where I, I did some raps and everything like that. And it's like, yo, you're going to do an album? I'm like, nah, I don't know if I'm going to do an album. I'll probably do a couple of songs and do a few features. Uh, but that probably won't happen until next year. Next year, I'll, I'll make the bandwidth and put some put some music out. Man, that Truth Works mixtape, I heard the samples of it. It's off the hook. So as soon as we get off here, I'm going to make sure I support it. I mean, it is it is truly off the hook, man. It's powerful. It's, 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 it's just really, really good music, man. Did you, did really you hear um, Volume 1 and Volume 2? I have not heard volume one or volume two. Yeah, I'm gonna send them. I'll send all three to you. Don't even worry about it. I'll send it to you uh, right now as we're speaking, so you have them. Oh, right on, man. I appreciate that. Appreciate anytime, that. Anytime. So, so, so those are different people from the different chapters or whatever, like that. No, so some, some, some are some are members of KHM and some are just regular artists. Um, so what we wanted to do with this project is we wanted to um, use it as funding for a lot of the community uh, work uh, that we do, like um, you know. Uh, helping uh you know the people in certain communities 
um, call town hall meetings to know who the politicians are in their communities or um, helping create an economic plan, a group economic plan for certain neighborhoods that are underprivileged um, and other things such as helping with debt elimination and doing health seminars and so forth like that. But now we're concentrating those funding towards KHMMG, which is Kingdom Harbor Ministries Music Group, which is a music label wow. that we're looking to launch um, if all goes well before the end of the year, you know, so we want to be able to create a holistic environment, a 360 degree uh, platform for artists to come into the music game and make sure we cover everything for them, right? Make sure they get their studio time, mixing and mastering, uh, make sure we do their promotions, we do their photo shoots, uh, we uh, set up concerts for them, get them on secular shows and networks um, and say whatever they want to say to promote because they're not backed by a secular music label where they have restraints on what they can and can't say, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And be able to flourish the way that the most high would want us to, so we can get the music out there to reach the masses. Right. So we want to remove any hindrances that will prevent an artist like that from being on the big stage without compromising their integrity by means of the secular music groups and labels that they would have to succumb to. Right. And they would have to say, okay, I won't say this. Okay. I won't do this. Okay. I won't wear fringes or whatever the case may be, because a lot of brothers that I've spoken with, went that route and they had to make a lot of compromises and sacrifices that affected that would have would have affected their integrity as an Israelite. So they just didn't really have an avenue to really get that. And, and that's what we want to raise money to. Um, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. So, uh, uh, the reason I. OK, so the next question is about the chapter launch. So you have you had a recent chapter launch uh, uh, in June 26 in North Carolina. Then you had an L.A. chapter launch. Then you had a DC Baltimore chapter launch and a Dallas chapter launch. How how did you go about the chapter launch? I mean, what is the prerequisite for that? Is it a team of eight? Is it a team of ten? I mean, so how did you say this is the city Wamba plant? Yes, I'm glad you're paying attention. We also had the Orlando launch in Orlando February launch. of 2020, yeah, and then we also had our Norfolk, uh, Virginia launch or VA Beach launch as well. Um, that wasn't um, a big launch. That was a small launch. And then we also had uh, uh, an unofficial launch in New Orleans, unofficial launch in New York. And um, what was the other one? Um, and there's another one. I always forget that other one because it's not as populated. <laughs> um, but we have about nine chapter launches now. So pretty much what it is is that um, we have uh, an app um, that people can uh, utilize to uh, receive push notifications from us. They can sign up for our group, sign up for membership. Uh, check out our social media handles. There's also a Bible on there, lessons on there, et cetera. And we use that app, put it in the hands of the people that were interested in Kingdom Harbor Ministries. And we got almost 600 um, people uh, who wow. have the app actively. And um, we use the app in order to concentrate um, any kind of surveys so we know where everybody's at, right? And then we do the YouTube channel, social media, kind of see where everybody's at, do a consensus of where the, the greatest population of people are at that are requesting uh, either for me to come out there, KHM to come out there, or just some kind of Hebrew to come out there and kind of do something in the community. And um, all those cities were handpicked based on the amount of requests that we got from those particular areas, right? So we uh, would like a minimum of about um, eight to 10 people in each one of these cities because it's different roles that each individual will take on to ensure that the chapter is successful. And as long as we have eight to 10 people, we can do a successful launch. But at our, our events, I think the, the least amount of people we had was about 35 and the most was about 50, you know? Wow. And um, this is with marketing promotion with this within the same month that we actually had the event, right? So I would talk about it, but the difficulty with launching these things uh, during COVID was that um, it was very difficult to secure a venue a lot of people didn't come out because of, you know, COVID-19. So um, the RSVP that we actually have initially had almost 80 to 90 people, but half of those people weren't able to come because, you know, by the time we set the venue about three weeks a month in advance, then some new regulation will come and say, oh, you know, you know, we see a surge of cases. So we have to, you know, scale back and, you know, you can only have X amount of people. So uh, certain events we had to turn people away, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Because we was full. And it was it could accommodate maybe a hundred people, but they only allowed us to have fifty people, maybe forty people the most in those venues, and then they charge almost two to three times the amount. So it was it was real crazy, but we 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 got it done uh, the best we could, and we made it happen. And now that all the regulations have started to subside, our Riley launch, we had almost fifty people that came out there, and I marketed that Monday. 
and the event was that Saturday. You know what I'm saying? We had almost 50 people to come out. And the next one is Houston, which we want to do at the end of this month. The last weekend of this month will be in Houston. Um, and then that one is going to be much bigger because it's a much bigger city. There's more people in that city that follow us. So we'll have our flyers soon. And once we have it, we'll start promoting. And then that's, that'll be our next chapter. Wow. So so is it is it is it basically uh like when they they hold they hold services together was it was it business based mm -hmm. or is it or was it community based or or like like when they launched a the chapter what it is okay we're gonna meet on Shabbat and we're gonna are we gonna start small businesses or like what is the, one of the main things about it? Yeah, so the main goal of it is to translate uh, all the stuff that we talk about the Hebrew culture um and all of that into viable real world solutions for societal ills that's experienced in our communities so we go pretty much on the premise of jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 7 where it says seek the peace of the city and intervene on its half before the most high for in its peace you shall have peace and um what i constantly say in regards to the chapter launches and just in general is that the reason why these cities are uproar because the israelites there we're not collectively together looking to resolve those issues. It's our job to seek the peace of the city and intervene on its behalf, whether or not Yah is allowing things to happen in the city or man is creating some ills on his own. But we are to do that so that we can have peace. We can have shalom. We can have completeness. We can be whole, right? That can only be done if we get involved in the economics of our communities uh, that are destitute, that have been redlined and you know, that is damaged, uh, you know, politically, where we have no uh, real representation. It's normally the minority groups that live in our majority cities or um, other areas that represent us. And it's never our best of interest, the gentrification that goes on, you know, uh, the predatory loans that's being given out, uh, the lack of financial opportunities and employment, um, the high health crises that we have in our community. Mm. Um, right now, we're dying at a, a, a sweltering rate in regards to um you know heart disease and cancer and all these other things so our job is we we want to be a herald right to let people know that the most highest kingdom is to come but before people can understand that message or have an ear to hear we want to take our resources manpower and our know-how from our torah culture template and transform it or translate it into a way where we can create products goods services and programs to alleviate the societal ills. And once we're able to remove those roadblocks from people, now we can draw them into the spiritual side of things. So it's wow. not a congregation, it's really just a, uh, a ministry organization, um, like a not-for-profit. And our job is to provide services, programs, goods, and products to a community or the areas of a community that are majority black and brown people that face societal ills that prevent them from having an advantage or for them to have an equity in their own cities. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's some serious stuff, man. Man. Uh so so that pretty much go down. You pretty much covered some of it, but I want to talk about that breakdown. You talk about culture, community, and autonomy. Because I got a question about the autonomy. I had a question about a month ago about the autonomy. Um, but can you just uh add a little bit to the culture community and autonomy is that basically the gist of the chapter itself culture community and autonomy yeah so that's the gist of khm in general um so uh kingdom when we say kingdom we're referring to the most high's kingdom yas kingdom when we say harbinger a harbinger is one that goes before a king an army or di or is a diplomat and their job is to announce the arrival of the king and also make preparations for his stay and also prepare the people to receive him, right? So they announce it, they go and make lodging preparations so that the king can come and settle there for whatever duty he has and also prepare that town, that city, that nation to receive the king, right? So our job in order for us to prep our people to receive the kingdom to come, we have to be able to reconstruct and restore the culture that we once had that allowed us to be a tight knit community. So that's where the teaching part of it is what we, what we do is we want to remove people away from the dogmas of society that has uh, kind of shielded them from that clear path to Yah and be able to give them the tools that they need to actually build a real community. But the only way that can be done is to have a common culture, uh, values, uh, do's and don'ts, you know, protocols, 
that uh, is taught from birth, uh, not even prenatally, all the way into adulthood, right? And then reinstitute those rites of passage, right? Um, and be able to have ceremonious life events, things that are culturally based, um, and be able to understand our um, ancestral inheritance that has been passed down to us um, by way of our customs and mannerisms, right? That we have contained in what's called the Bible today. And we believe that if these things are restored to our community uh, the way it was intended, then we'd be able to have a more close knit community. And what happens when you have communities that have a common culture, they tend to be very autonomous or self-governing, right? They tend to take care of their own, right? They tend to look for ways to govern different social affairs within a community. They take care of the sick, they take care of the poor, they take care of any issues between, you know, groups within the community, they provide their own services, um, they provide their own programs for the community, they have their institutes, they have their senior citizens home, they have their own ambulance if you get sick, they have their people on the police force for the district that's in their town, et cetera. So unless we're able to get to a point where we have a common culture that contains the customs and mannerisms that is ancestral and that is passed down to us, in a, in a way where it is almost like a time capsule, right? That we can crack open and say, wow, look at these things. And a lot of times we have difficulty interpreting, uh, excuse me, interpreting things uh, within a time capsule because it's displaced from the time period in which we live. Um, however, there's typically letters, notes, and other things within that time capsule to kind of explain what these items are so we know how to apply it. So we're simply just doing this, that. We're cracking open the time capsule of our culture that our ancestors intended for us to have today find a contemporaneous way of installing it in our, in our uh, communities, bring people closer together amongst these common customs, and then from there become autonomous, govern our own social affairs, and take care of the needs of the community and eliminate or reduce and deduce the societal ills that are plaguing us because society was not built with us in mind. So therefore we have to take mm. matters in our own hands and we have to take control of our own community. Man. So yeah, cool. okay, that's, that makes a lot better understanding. Because when I hear hear the uh, autonomy, some people think separate, independent mm -hmm. of, outside. Mm -hmm. We're gonna build our own. You know what I mean? And so yeah. a lot of people think about you know we always say about the Black Wall Street and different things right. like that. And it's just okay if 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 it wasn't really designed with us in mind, if we start to build these things. And this is not out of fear. Just a just a, just an innocent question. What would stop a, a Black Wall Street from happening again? When you uh sing, you know, you on you on a strange land. You know what I mean? Yeah, and right. I think uh, but we'll talk about the Exodus in a second. But 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 as far as uh autonomy, what would stop a a, a Tuskegee from happening again? Correct, or like the destruction of Black Wall Street. Um, or Rosewood. Oh, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. Black Wall Street, man. I'm sleeping. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's Black okay. Wall Street. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, you got to think about well, too, though. The Tuskegee Institute uh, was established because we had to be autonomous, right? Um, you know, it's no longer fully Black owned anymore, but what I'm saying is it was initially started out of the need to be autonomous, right? Because we were being rejected from going to certain universities and institutes, mm. et cetera. But then, as you know, they conducted experiments there that was. Um, not advantageous for us, right? It was not in our best interest and it caused more harm than good, right? Um, so Black Wall Street, Rosewood, Seneca Village in New York, right? These are some notable places where we had our own um, economy, we had our own politics going on, we had our own uh, businesses and, you know, families was close and tight knit. And as you can see over history, these things were destroyed. Now in 2021, there are several ways that we can establish those things uh, without drawing too much attention that will allow us to be destroyed, right? So a good example of that um, is out here in Atlanta, we have uh, various municipalities, right? Or incorporated municipalities, which are cities that are incorporated for the purpose of uh, doing commerce, right? Most cities, almost all cities in the United States um, are incorporated because cities do commerce, right? Because they do, they provide other services, and other things outside of just collecting taxes in order for them to uh, supplement operations, right? So what I um, and a, as a, what I'm a big proponent of is finding a way is how do we get in control of these things legally, right? So that way, if anything does happen, we have a legal standing for what it is that we're doing. So you typically have to get involved in the politics of the community, right? And when I say politics, what I'm saying is, I'm not saying to choose politics that they're handing us. I'm saying we can actually uh, create our own city. Now, 
there's uh, every state has their own laws and there are uh, something what's called the home rule. You have Dylan's rule and you have the home rule, right? So Dylan's rule or Dylan's law uh, pertains to uh, states having full control of everything within their borders, right? So if you start a city, a town, you have to follow nothing but state laws. The bad thing about that is that if a city or a town, which is a smaller uh, locale, has specific issues, if you're waiting on the state to address them, it could take forever because the state has to deal with every other city, every other municipality and town, et cetera. Uh, however, there was something called the home rule and a home rule was installed in several states, which means that cities are allowed to have a degree of autonomy, pass ordinances and statutes specific for that city <clears throat> and be able to govern those matters uh, as long as those things are not in opposition of the state constitution, right? <clears throat> so in learning this, you know, I've taught several seminars and I've spoke at several town hall meetings uh, teaching our communities how to start their own cities in states that have the home rule law on the books, right? Mm. Um, so if, if we're able, let's say, for example, we want to buy a plot of land as one sort of garden, how can you secure and protect that garden? <clears throat> what if they create new ordinances or statutes saying, hey, you got to update to do A, B, and C, or the city is now reclaiming this land, or the city is now zoning this area to be um, no longer residential, but a commercial district, and we have some, you know, a, a mall that wants to be built here and so forth. The only way you can inter intercede is if you are the one responsible for crafting the laws. Legislation comes by way of creating a city council, and the city council has representatives on there for each district of the particular city or municipality. And they represent the interests of the people that are living or the residents that are living in those areas and the businesses that are in those areas. So our objective is once we are able to start a city, we can then influence the law. We can then influence the execution of the law, which would be your executive branch. We can then in influence the judicial portion, which are municipal courts. And we can do all these things just by the people coming together and creating this. And if anybody wants to know how that's done from scratch, all you gotta do is go back to my YouTube channel and type municipality in, and I've done several videos on this, right? Where I break it down step by step. So the thing that happened with Rosewood, with uh, Seneca Village and with um, um, Black Wall Street is that they did not control the politics for that entire town. They did not control the municipal courts for the entire town, and then not, they're not controlled the executive uh, force, which will include the police officers, because the police officers are actually helping their white neighbors against them. So they did not control those three elements. If you're not controlling those three branches of government, it's going to be very difficult for you to protect your investments and very difficult for you to get any kind of uh, remedy and recourse from any injuries that's committed towards your community. Right. So that's the first thing. The second thing is those small areas did not have international trade agreements. When you mm -hmm. have an IP or intellectual property that you are able to generate within your community and then you make contracts with other nations, with other corporations, businesses, ex uh, non for profit organizations, <clears throat> etc. Now you have other entities that are looking over the shoulder of local government, local law enforcement, local judicial courts, and which means that they have a vested interest in your survival. So if something was to happen that is afflicting you from producing your intellectual property to assist those other international nations, they're gonna wanna get involved or find some way to assist you so you can come out of that situation. Uh, that's the second thing. The third thing wow. is they did not have what's called community currency. Community currency is a way for you to collect the national currency and not touch the national currency that is coming into the community, but you create a supplemental currency by way of a card that's only used within the businesses of that town and use that card based on the value that you apply to it, the credit that you apply to it to do business within your community. So when people come from the outside, come in to shop and do business or whatever, you collect their national dollar and exchange the national dollar to them. However, when you go to patronize them the business in the community, you're not, you don't touch the national dollar using a community currency. Now that mm -hmm. is helpful in several ways because number one, you don't require aid from an external entity that uses the national dollar because when you create your, your community currency, you then get other investors to invest in that currency. 
and being that they have stock in that currency, then if anything happens to the economy within that community, then they will get involved, right? And then you also have this surplus of national funds that are not touched that you can use for any kind of recourse or reparations that you may need to create for yourselves in the effect that things are damaged. Because Black Wall Street, after it was destroyed, was built back up, but it never reached the zenith that it once had, right? Yeah. And that's because there were certain things that they weren't doing or putting in place to actually you know, uh, protect themselves. Another thing is you have to have an airport. You have to have a, a ship, an airport, a mm. bus, trucks. You need these things because otherwise you're going to have to rely on the city, town, or state to allow you to have these things, right? That's very important. The other thing is you cannot rely on the um, resources of the city by way of utility. So if you're going to create a city, you must create what's called what's called self-sustainable infrastructure, meaning that you must create a property that can sustain itself, that does not require any water pipelines being run ran through, any electrical lines being ran through, none of these things, because then you're dependent upon the state and the city and the municipality or town to provide these services in any event that they're not happy with something you're doing, like Flint, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, where they're dirtying up the water because they redirected the water from a major city oh, from man. some other area, then, then you don't have to worry about that because now what you're doing is you're collecting your own rainwater. You're recycling your own water from your white water, your dark gray water to your black water, right? Using that to fertilize the soil, right? You're also growing your own food. You're also collecting your own solar power, your own wind power by way of windmills or your hydroelectric power you can create as well. These are ways that we have to be self-sustainable because also if you control that municipality, you also have a public safety force or what we call a police force. So they are they by law are allowed to have all types of weapons in order to defend and protect that community by law, legally. So then you can protect the things that you own. So there's there's a lot of things looking on hindsight and me doing extensive research on these towns. And it was that there was at least 20 of these towns right after the Civil War that occurred from then to the Jim Crow laws that existed until they started pushing integration because they saw how much we flourish without their aid. And that became dangerous because now we would have the momentum to get reparations. We have the momentum to protect ourselves and we will have the momentum to get international aid. Last thing I'll say is that the one of the reasons why Malcolm X got killed wasn't because, well, first of all, he didn't get killed because people from the Nation of Islam put a hit on him. That's not what happened. Malcolm X, when he went to uh, um, uh, to Arabia and, uh, and you know, and he went and took his Shahada there and saw all the different Muslims of all different ethnicities around the world and so forth, and he came back and he saw the condition of our people. Not only did he realize that he was being controlled by the NOI and that he had a beef with them, but he realized the only way for us to be successful, and this is why he started his own organization, was that we have to get other diplomats and officials, right, from other African nations to help him bring a charge of human rights violation against the U.S to the public international stage at the UN. Hmm. Now, um, being that KHM, we work with the UN, um, striving to be one of their NGOs and non-governmental organizations, uh, trying to push this international decade for the, um, international decade for the, uh, wow, how did I forget this? I must be tired or something like that. Uh, for the um, international decade for the, oh, shoot. Fluency is off today. Hold on. I get it right quick. And I want to share my screen if you have. Um, yes, sir. Uh, International Gate for People of African Descent. That's what it is. Um, and um, the interesting thing about this, and a lot of people don't know about this, and if you don't get grandfathered in or uh, find a way to put pressure on the U.S. to implement it, then after 2024, you're done, right? You, the, the U.N. is going to move on to something else more important than what's happening to us behind Emmy Lines here in America. Um, but if I can share my screen, I want to, I want you guys to see this um, real quick. It's called the International Decade for People of African Descent. And what, they, what they've done is that the, um, the Human Rights Commissioner has a group uh, that is working with this program. And their job is to go to every member state of the UN that agreed to the Durban Declaration 
that put forth resolutions in which this particular program is predicated on and see what they're doing to implement the suggestions that will be given here uh, to alleviate people of African descent from being denied justice, recognition, and development. Us as Israelites, we are a subgroup of the African diaspora. And as a subgroup that identifies with the tribe of Israel, right, we also mm -hmm. have access to these things. And these are the things that will also help us to not only create our own cities, but maintain it and defend it legally in any other way, in the event that it comes under some form of destruction, right? Wow. And um, when, when that group that came to various uh, countries who are member states of the UN to actually investigate to see what all these other nations are doing to implement these programs, guess what nation is doing the least implementation? United States. <laughs> United States says, hey, thank you. Yeah, we know we're part of that program. Yeah, we, we know we send somebody there every year in March 25th. March, March 25th is actually a holiday, a national, I mean, international holiday uh, for the victims of the transatlantic slave trade and their descendants. The wow. international day. People really don't know that, but it's March 25th every year. So what happens is every member state sends their diplomats to the UN and they, they have this conference where they speak about, you know, the atrocities that occurred in the transatlantic slave trade and some countries apologize like Ghana and other countries and so forth. And then they tell you what they're doing to actually take advantage of this program to create resources and opportunities for development, economics, housing, businesses for people who are disfranchised of African descent in their respective countries. Well, wow. the UN, the US, well, every time the US comes, they give some kind of robotic speech and they never issue an apology and they never mm. say what they're doing to implement this project or this program within their their country never so this wow. group that's been created by the high the human rights commissioner they came to the u.s and they created a report because every time they came to the u.s and said hey show us what you're doing you know what the u.s says oh yeah we we know we are a member of that and everything that's great but we have our own programs this is the programs that we have here. You know, our Justice Department is doing this and this program is doing this. Oh, you, did you know Obama had this little program for black kids? Yeah, we had that going on. And they're like, okay, well, even though you have this, there's no change in opportunity mm. for people of African descent in your country. Matter of fact, things are getting worse with police brutality, redlining, and all that stuff. And the U.S. says, oh, yeah, we know. But, you know, here's a couple of stats that's showing that there is some market improvement. And they're like, well... The improvement that these other nations are having, like Germany and other nations who are implementing these programs, they 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 are extremely successful in what they're doing, simply because they're integrating these resolution suggestions into their current uh, laws, and it's making a difference for the people of African descent. But you guys are not doing that. They wrote this whole report where they even mentioned Malcolm X and Malcolm X's attempt to bring the U.S. under scrutiny because of their treatment of people of African descent within their borders. And that as a result of that, things, the certain events led up to his death that we know was orchestrated by the FBI and other governmental agencies at the time. You know what I'm saying? So the reason why I'm saying this is because it's only when you're able to have your local community connected on the international scale can you really have big brothers watching over your shoulder in the event that somebody comes to attack you where they can actually have your back. And unfortunately, those cities didn't have it. But today we have more resources, more knowledge and more uh, know how to actually implement these things and get it done. Man, that's powerful, man. So this thing that says to share the screen, uh, you can share. I had to click on share in order to share it. I don't know what happened. Is, is it sharing it now? Was, it was on there. It said add to stream. Add to stream. Oh, there it is. Yeah, you did. You did something, and it showed up now. Oh, there we go. I guess I got to click on it on this end or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this okay. is it right here. So wow. you can go here, and again, this program is only to twenty twenty four. We have okay. a little over three years to take advantage of it because if we don't, they're moving on to something else. This mm -hmm. is going to be. You know, it's something mm -hmm. in the back of their mind, but recognition. So we say, hey, we, we identify as Israelites, right? Well, how about mm -hmm. getting recognized on an international scale, right? The reason why, let me let me say this. Mm -hmm. in, in the United States, one of the groups that are not uh, like the most, you know, and I would say top 10 is the Israelites. They call us the black Hebrew Israelites. Some, some of us are identified as black identity extremists. 
right? And then they try to connect rogue individuals to our community. Um, now, the reason why they can do those things and get away with it, you know why? Because we don't have other entities that are protecting us. For example, if you are a Jew, you have several organizations within your community that if you are, your rights are ever violated or your community is ever attacked, you have these entities that go out who, who have legal power, who have economic power, and they'll make sure the, the grievances that they have are addressed and remedy and recourse is given. We don't have that in our community. So it's okay. They can attack us. For example, Chinese Americans. There has been yes. an attack on Chinese Americans as of late. Guess what Biden did? Oh, let me write these laws up. You know why? Because they sent all of their advocates from all of their organizations and their ties to China to go and, and lobby at the White House. And when they went up in there, they saw Biden. They smacked him upside his head like, yo, come on, come on, get me here. <laughs> And they walked us behind in there and sat down at the Oval Office and said, yo, sign this, man. Sign this right here. You know what Biden did? Okay. Yeah, let me sign this out. But yet African-Americans have been asking for help, aid, and assistance for hundreds of years in this country. And not one law was signed on our behalf the way it was signed for Asian-Americans. Not one. Wow. Not wow. one. Wow. Because they have entities that they've created within their community and they have international ties to another nation. And therefore, with those resources and manpower and economic power and political power, now they can let you. Because when you have power, you don't protest. You negotiate. Wow. You Say that power, again. You to protest. Say that again. <laughs> exactly. When you have, when you don't have power, you protest. Wow. Now remember, I didn't. See, now I, I think I remember maybe one march of Chinese Americans that ever happened that I, that, you know, recently because of this, this new phenomenon. But for the most part, they had their advocates at the White House lobbying. I never seen them take one advocate from the black community to the White House and sign hate crime laws. Now, wow. there were some recent hate crime laws that were signed into uh, bills that were signed into law the past 10 years on our behalf, but they're very small and they're rarely enforced, right? Rarely enforced. With this, these are felonies that if you assault somebody, it's normally a misdemeanor against a Chinese American, and they and they say, "Oh, this was a hate crime." You're doing time, seven plus years. It's a felony. Mm. I don't see that happening with black people because if so, I don't see the cops arresting Chinese people, putting their knee in their neck, right, yeah. shooting them on sight, grabbing them up and throwing them around. Do, do you see that? You have a lot of footage of the of the um, police doing that to Asian American. No, if so, no, no. can you point to me? <laughs> what about Jews? Do you see Jews with the yarmulke falling off, getting slammed to the ground by the police, being mm. tasered by the police, being shot by the police, having a knee in their neck? I, I don't see that. What about Arabs? What about East Indians? I, I mean, I don't see it for these groups. Mm. But when it comes to us, it's there. So with this program, when you are recognized as a particular, what we called a, um, a body politic, when you your community is identified as a body politic and you are given recognition on an international scale, what the U.S. is supposed to do based on these guidelines is remove all obstacles that prevent their equal employment of all human rights, economic, social, cultural. That's why you hear me say culture a lot, civil and political, including what the right to development. So. The mm. UN didn't have this in place when Black Wall Street was around. Matter of fact, the UN wasn't even an entity at that time. Mm -hmm. Number one, Rosewood, the UN didn't have this on the books. It didn't even exist. It. Seneca Village, they didn't have this on the books, but today it's there. And guess what? You would think this would be in the national headlines. Oh, of course not. Because imagine the United States allowed African Americans to know that this exists, what position that would put them in. The reason why you cannot bring any kind of international charging against the U.S. is because there are major treaties, two to three major treaties, that almost every member state signs except for the U.S. The U.S. has not signed those treaties. If they signed wow. it, then if we decide we want to bring a case against the U.S. to the U.N., the U.S. will have to be subject to their courts. Just like when you look at those African countries, you know, that the mm -hmm. IMF goes into and all of a sudden they bankrupt. And I'm not saying there's a correlation for the record because I don't know who's watching, but I'm simply saying that's, that tends to be the trend that what happens. The IMF goes in there, the nation goes bankrupt, and all of a sudden they're signing all these laws and stuff. They are under the scrutiny of the, of the, um, of the United Nations. Therefore, if there's something happens such as a human rights violation, you know what happens? They send the UN. 
peacekeepers in to restore peace. But you just know you when peace officers coming in here when we get beaten down by the cops. There's a mm. reason for that. And mm, that is mm, because mm. black people at large and the Israelite community on a more minuscule scale, we are not set up and established like this. Wow. Everything is here that we can utilize to create a blueprint, but because enough of us don't know. You know what the U.S. says to this group that came in here, this working group of experts on people of African descent that came here to examine and investigate if the U.S. is implementing these things in order to improve the conditions of people of African descent within their countries. You know what happens when they come in? The U.S. says things like, oh, you know, if African America is one of it, they would have been protesting right now at all their U.S. capitals in here in D.C. for this, but they're not doing it. Well, you know why we're not doing it? Because we don't know about it. <laughs> we don't know about it. We're not unaware of it. This is crazy. We're unaware you know, of it. The way Man. that this thing is set up is ridiculous. But as an Israelite community, we should be on the cups of getting this done. This is how we can seek the peace of our cities, promote the effective implementation of national and international legal framework so we can establish the equal enjoyment of our human rights, economic, social, cultural, civil, political, and the right to development, which means land, property, whatever the case, this helps us to get around redlining, promote the effective implementation of national and international legal frameworks that allows us to establish a legal entity that protects us on our behalf, withdraw reservations contrary to the object and purpose of the international uh, convention, Undertake what? A comprehensive review of domestic legislation with their view, check it out, to identify and abolish in provisions that entail direct or indirect discrimination, which means they have to examine every law in the book and see whether or not, I'm talking about state and federal, hmm. if they create a disadvantage to our communities. That's what they're obligated to do. Adopt and strengthen comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation and ensure its effective implementation. Well, Asian Americans were able to do that without this. Unfortunately, because we're not that collectively together, we can't do that on our own. We need something like this to bound together behind in order to get done. And this allows us to do it, adopt, strengthen and implement action oriented policies, programs and projects to combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia and related intolerance, establish mm. or strengthen national mechanisms or institutions with a view to formulating, monitoring and implementing policies to combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, related intolerance and promoting racial equality with the participation of representatives of civil society. My brother, these wow. things that we see here is just the tip of the iceberg. It keeps going on to so education, Mm. Quality and awareness raising, promote the greater knowledge and recognition and respect for the culture, history, and heritage. If we're saying we're Israelites, where's the preservation, knowledge, and recognition and respect for our culture, history, and heritage? They don't have that. That's why they're able to parade us on the TV and condemn us the way they do, signal us the way they do, label us, mislabel us the way they do, because we're not organized like this. We're not utilizing the things on hand because they are not telling us, they're not teaching, they're not promoting, they're not marketing it. So therefore, we don't have anything to rally behind, but we can do this. And I've been putting this out since 2015. For mm. six years, I've been putting this out. Six years. You know how much momentum I've had? This much. Because people wow. would rather me debate. They would rather me teach. They would rather me do everything else, but actually give them an effective plan to fix the societal ills in the community. Man, could you share that link and uh, can you share that in the, in the in the link in the comments? It's not gonna yeah. let me do it unless I'm an admin. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, um, yeah, you send it. Okay, to me I can that. email it to you, and you can yeah. share it in there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'll I'll make sure that is taken care. Of. That is that is so amazing because we look uh left in the dark about it, and we look at and it's nothing against the House of Representatives and the Senate, but we look at those people as our representative so they say don't worry about it we'll take care of you we you know we'll go fight on your behalf and we say okay and then things happen and we're like hey what's going on and like we we working on it you know and so you you may you make some good points when you said that that's very very interesting yeah wow. and, and, and and uh two things i mean a lot of things and again i don't want to take up the time my brother because i know you also um you know have a lot of things to do as well but we don't have a lot of grassroots support organizations in our community. A grassroots mm -hmm. support organization is a specialized subset of intermediate non-governmental organizations that provide services and support to local groups of disadvantaged rural or urban household and individuals. Name mm -hmm. me 
three grassroots support organizations in your in your community right now, my brother. I'll wait. Mm, mm, mm. Just name me three that you know that's for our people. Just name me three. Hmm. Exactly. That's how you know there's a problem. <laughs> we don't have that. Because what happens is their objective is to create services and provide support to local groups of disadvantaged peoples, households, and individuals within urbanized areas. That's their sole role. Tell me two community foundations that you know about that's in your community. I'll wait. Two community foundations. A community foundation is an entity that's created by a community with the sole purpose of raising funds to create grants that is then disseminated to the residents of that community. So therefore, they can pay for car loans, pay for mortgages, pay for college tuition, pay for business startups, et cetera, et cetera. Name two of them in your city right now for your community. I'll wait. Man. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the reason why I'm bringing this out is because this is what other ethnic groups are doing and why they are successful. Mm -hmm. This is what they're doing. Now, when we talk about our heritage and our culture, identifying as Israelites, we say, hey, our ancestors have done some things that – that cause a cascade of consequences to be fall upon us. And again, the scripture says that in the third or fourth generation, the most High is going to visit the iniquity up into the third or fourth generation. That iniquity is going to be visited until somebody stands in a gap and say, wait, we got to do something about this. Right. We got to turn because otherwise the most High will allow his judgment that's coming upon these nations to also afflict us when it shouldn't. Because according to the biblical model, when the most High was judging Egypt, Goshen was untouched. Mm. Hell came. The locusts came, wow. you know, the, the lice came, the boils came, all of that came. But it said Goshen was untouched. However, we don't have these entities set up, these Goshen set up within the cities in which we live that is able to be autonomous. And then, like you said, put the provisions out that protects us from being prematurely destroyed so we could be self-sustained as we wait out for all the things that are happening in the outside society. We're not looking to pick up arms and fight the government. We're not looking to overthrow the government. We're not looking to uh, stage a national militia where we want to threaten the supremacy of other groups. We're not doing any of that. We simply want to achieve autonomy, just like every other major ethnic group has in America. And we want to have the services, the support systems, the programs, the civil protections, economic protection, political protections, lobbying groups, et cetera. We just want equity. I don't want equality. Equality doesn't work. Equity works. What's the difference wow. between equality and equity? Yes. The difference is we fight too much for equality and not enough for equity. I'm going to show you the difference. Let me bring up mm. a picture. Real quick. Yes, please. Tell me the difference between equality and equity. Whoa. Yes. Check it out. Yeah. Check it out. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you my screen real quick. Give me one second. You're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. All right. Mm -hmm. Give me one second. All right. Let me know when I can share my screen. Let me get to my, all right, let me stop the screen. Let me share my screen. All right, let me do this. All right, and just give me one second. I'll be right with you. I have to walk away for one second, okay? Okay. All right. Man, that's amazing. Yes, um, and I was thinking about that too, man. And, and even when I was just talking to different, um, Oh, oh, it's right here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add it to the screen. The stream. Uh, different uh people that that uh many members but one body. They bring different uh aspects to this culture to this table. They bring many aspects to the table, and don't don't one person have everything. And that's one thing I like about it. You know what I mean? But the things that people bring are so valuable, are so important, are so needed. You know what I mean? When we think that only our part is the only part, then, then that's a problem. And we got too much fighting and bickering in Israel, too much murmuring, complaining and fighting and bickering. Okay, there you go, brother. All right. Hello? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so Elcom Barlow says, how do we move forward? Implement to this? Uh, well, you can sit in in our, our, our meetings at KHM when we do think tank sessions on subject matters like this, right? Um, 
we, the, the objective of this is to teach other groups how to implement these things within their own organization so they can leverage the organization in the event that there's some kind of societal ill that they're experiencing that they can get remedy and recourse for, right? So remedy and recourse, remedy is there's a situation that's happening and there's a way out, right? The recourse is if there's any damages that you incur because of the societal ill that's plaguing you, that's not a fault of your own, that you're able to get reparations for that damage, right? So if we look at the screen, you have reality, you have equality, you have equity and you have liberation. Let me let me let me break this down. This is yeah. This please is break it down. All right. The reality is the first man standing on the box is most major ethnic groups in America. That's mm -hmm. that man standing, the one that's standing in all those boxes there. Then you have what's called the reality, and the reality is a couple of other subgroups that may not have as many boxes, but they do have an advantage. My mom used to work for the welfare system in New York City for thirty six years. Right. And um, when, while working there, uh, a lot of things happened in the early years of what's called the Cold War. And what was happening was there was a lot of um, immigrants that were migrating here from Europe that came over here to get solace and, uh, and several other things. And working at the welfare office, guess what they did? They approved them automatically for almost every request that they asked for. So if they needed money to start a business, money for housing, money for this, money for that, the city gave it to them. Yet, at the same time, African-Americans would come there and get denied. She witnessed wow. this firsthand. It was incredible. But nonetheless, so now we have the situation here where you have all these boxes, the middle person and the person there. We, we're, we're really, some of us are on that middle box, but most of us is right there where that guy is at. <laughs> yeah. he, he's not even on level ground. He's right there in a ditch. <laughs> you know, forget a box. He's in a ditch. Wow. Equality is black people like, yeah, yeah, we want equality. Well, check it out. How can you have equality? Now, let me give you an example of equality, right? Let's say there's a job, a corporate job, right? That's available to somebody in the community. Let's say an individual, um, our our um our um Caucasian peer, uh, for example, um on the on the um application, they check white, right? It says white, or you black, African American, whatever. So they check yeah. white. And then they have a history, a family history, where their parents have generational wealth. Their parents have property, houses. They not only do they have house, they have equity because you mm. leverage your house as equity. They also they put their kids through good charter schools, private schools, right, or even um, good public schools that they have in their communities, right. They don't have any history of institutional racism being pushed against them. They didn't have the parents didn't go through or their ancestors didn't go through slavery. And, and, and mind you, with slavery, we would an institute was never created in order to repair us from all of the psychological and physiological damage that we incurred through slavery, even spiritual and cultural damage. There was no institute that was created to repair all of these aspects that gave us black institutions. Black institutions did not teach us how to repair all the damages, because what happened was in the past, when free slaves started happening around, there was a Christian organization that was established to take free blacks and push them back to Liberia. Check this out. This is how you know the black institutions didn't do nothing to assist us. What happens oh. is when this small group went over to Liberia, we're talking about black freed African-Americans went over to Liberia and they were given a degree of autonomy in order to set up shop in Liberia. You know what they did? They treated the locals there just like the white man treated us. Stockholm syndrome was in full effect because we were never repaired from the damage that they committed to us. So we treated them like second class citizens. We treated them like they demanded to give us things that we were entitled to get things. We had a form of white privilege and blackface. It was bad. Wow. Anybody it was bad. So, so when you have a type of mindset like that, you're not repairing people culturally, the way how we lived in our normal culture, the way how we lived in our normal environment. The, the way that we respected nature and didn't over industrialize the cities in which we live, the towns which we live, the way where everybody contributed to the community, the way that we had wealth via resources. I'm not talking about paper money. I'm not talking about negotiable debt instrument. I'm not talking about fiat currency. I'm talking about something that is backed by an actual tangible concrete resource. Right. So so when you're not repairing these things spiritually, we had a totally different spiritual system before we came over here. Diet, we had a totally different diet. Now we were supposed to eat chitlins and and, and wow. oxtail and all that stuff. That stuff is not healthy. That's not a diet that we had before we got over here. Those are the scraps that we had to use to eat to survive off of. 
and, and praise the most High for our ancestors that had the heart and stomach to do that so we could be here today. Everybody that's watching this, your ancestors that, that sacrificed and did what they could that you could be here today, they were the strong ones that survived. They were the ones that did whatever it took to get you here today. Some of them even compromised. Mm. But if not for those sacrifices, you wouldn't be here today. So you do have strong genes. OK, just keep that in mind. But on top of that, because there was no reparations in other areas, when we went there, we thought just like the people who oppressed us and we oppress our own people. So now when you get to equality, you have this job that's set up before. You have this 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 white individual going for the job. But then you have this black individual who do not have generational wealth, whose family lives in an apartment. They have they have no land. They have no inheritable generational wealth. They've had a, a history of ancestral institution of slavery. They had a history of epigenetic changes that occurred to the psyche of their ancestors because they was afflicted by being flogged, beaten, told them that you were secondhand, etc. They were raised in public schools that start them off with history, which is not standardized for, for, for the record, which is not standardized. Therefore, every state can teach history the way it, it, it wants to up until the sixth grade. It's not standardized. When they learn about their history, they told you're black, which is nothing. What the heck is black? That's an adjective. That's a color. That's that does not connect mm. you to anybody or anything. Mm. And so, yeah, you started off as a slave. That's what you. Oh yeah, you know the the Chinese. We did this, you know, and you know, in uh, in Europe we did that, and you know, the East Indians did that. that. And oh, oh oh yeah, you use a slave. So now you have this slave mindset. Now you in a community where there's drugs being pushed there, prostitution being pushed there, lack of resources, lack of opportunities. So therefore, that's going to affect your actual resume, when you decide you want to go to school and become somebody, then you have your peers teasing you, making fun of you. So look, mm, you mm, have mm. people now that's saying, yeah, just give me just give me the same opportunity, which is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, but I reserve, I want to be, want to be <laughs> equality. Give me the same opportunity, but yet you're not asking for equity. Equity is what we see on the the um the, the third panel. Equity is, look, 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 wait, wait, before you give me an equal opportunity, I want you to provide for me all the resources to repair mm. my condition so we can compete at the same level as every other ethnic group. Wow. Therefore, we all can see what's going on on the ball game. Because Man. when you don't ask for equity, they are going to give you that civil rights movement, ask for equality. They gave it to you. Y'all got it now. Affirmative action, y'all got it now. But guess what? When you look statistically, nothing has changed because there's no equity. So Damn. liberation is we have to do these things in a society that has not been designed with us in mind, but it was designed for us to be perpetual labor. And the moment that that has ceased, now they use us for slavery for other means, which is the slavery by other means or slavery by another name is now they use us as a product to sell commercial goods. Now you see black people on TV. You know, black people are the face of, of the Democratic Party and black people this and black people they're just using us. Mm. That's it. Oh, we got a black celebrity. He's pushing Nike. Yeah, I want to get Nikes because of this black celebrity. They're turning you back into a consumer slave. Preach. They're keeping you away from access to resources and all of these things. They are shutting you out from this. So what happens is now there's a fence up. And because that fence is up, now you're asking for equality. But you're wondering why nothing is changing after the Civil Rights Movement, the Voting Act which is an act, by the way. That's another conversation altogether. You ask the voters and they give it to you, and now like, why are they complaining? We give them what they asked for. First of all, we never asked for integration. They put it in our minds, and we bought it, and they found some people in our community to agree to it, made them politicians, and now forced us into there. They, they gave us what we asked for because we did not ask them for the right things. So now what happens in liberation, we create a situation where there's no fence. And no matter mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. it is in our community, we don't need their equity. We don't need their equality because we created a way to remove the fence and get access to everything we need, independent of the people we have to put our hand out and ask, please give me this, please give me that. It's a totally different ball game. And it starts first spiritually, culturally, and then from there goes to politically, economically, ex education, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So this this is a serious thing that we're dealing with here. And unless you're able to see an example like that visually, you don't know what type of position that you're in. Man, this brought some clarity to me when I see that equality. We do hear about equality. A lot. All we need is 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 equality. But it's like, man, they all they all equal on the box. 
but they but the the, the last guy can't even see. He, st- he can't even see the game. He don't even know what's going on. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but what happens is when you have other ethnic groups that do have equity in the stake and stock of the communities that they live in, they know everything that's going on. You know why? Because their people is in the legal circles, the political circles, the executive circles, the judicial circles, the economic circles, the advertising and marketing circles, the the TV network circles, the music circles, all realms of society, they have their people in. Mm. That's why they know everything that's coming that's gonna happen before it happens. That's why they can prepare their community to respond, to defend, to get a way out because they have people everywhere. But black people, we look down on people that try to get a degree and and, and become a, a a police officer, right? Or some some form of criminal justice. We look down on people who wants to make a career in the legal system. You become a lawyer. We look down on people who want to become a judge or people who want to become a politician. Oh, shoot. Uh-oh. Hold on real quick. I think my battery died. Can okay. you still hear me? I can hear you, but I, the okay. picture's gone. It's okay. My battery died. I'll keep talking. Um, on my camera that I had. Um, so we, 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 they're able to have their people in all these places, and that's why they can prepare for anything that comes against their community. Well, we, if we identify as Israelites, well, we had our Esthers, we had our Mordecais, we had our mm-hmm. Daniels, we had our Yosefs. But today, we don't want our people in those places because then we speak bad about them. Mm. But other mm-hmm. communities, they know how to keep good relationships for people that live outside the community. Check it out. And the Jewish community in East Brooklyn, when I lived in New York, I had a friend that lived there right next to the hood, not even far from the hood. It's like night and day looking at both communities, right? Their community, based on their culture, teaches several basic principles that everybody is entitled to do if you're going to live in that community. You are obligated. It is an unwritten rule you're obligated to do. That is, the moment that a child is born, number one, they're reared up with all of the values that they need to know about the community, the do's and don'ts, the taboos, et cetera. And then when that child gets old enough, they go to their bar mitzvah or their bat mitzvah. So they go through their rites of passage to ensure that that child, and in response to a biological change by means of hormone changes, testosterone and estrogen that goes on in the boy's body and the girl's body, they are being transitioned to adulthood biologically. However, that does not mean mentally, that if they're ready, that doesn't mean physically that they're ready. That doesn't mean uh, psychologically that they're ready. That doesn't mean uh, 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 economically. They're, they're not ready for anything like that. However, the biological changes is telling the culture, hey, this individual is, is going to adulthood. So they take that individual and they put them through various rites of passage to see if they are mentally capable of taking on adult responsibilities by giving them activities and other things to engage in that seems like it's a child thing for their age, but it's really training them for, I'll give you a good example. That board game, you ever, you ever heard that board game Life? Yes, yes. You ever heard that board game Monopoly? You yes. know why these things were started? To teach people in certain ethnic groups how the world works in the form mm. of a board game. <laughs> More than just a game then, huh? So, so they, they find rites of passage to put the child through, the adolescent through who transitioned to their teenage years to see if they're mentally, spiritually, physically, and emotionally capable of adulthood and responsibility. Not only that, they also make sure that that individual has a trade. Notice I said trade. Make sure they have a trade despite whatever they want to endeavor in because if everything fails, they still have the trade to fall back on. That's why they remove trade schools from our communities, but that's neither here nor there. To have a trade, Preach. and then when that person decides to create a business, have some kind of endeavor, or whatever career path, the entire community is obligated to come behind them until they are successful. And once that person is successful, then they must also participate in the same thing as it pertains to their community. It's an unwritten pact that everybody follows within that community because their culture tells them that's the only viable way for you to survive and thrive in a country that is not your own. Wow, man, man, oh man, that's 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 some. <laughs> you hit us with some heavy, man. That is that's that's amazing. That's that's so amazing. So, okay, I can understand, man. That that about the autonomy is just is just so amazing. But I, I think okay. So what about uh is Israel culture? So well, I got really two last questions, and then so I know you got to go. But the no main problem. one of the main things is we're talking about. The unity, okay, 
um, the Stockholm syndrome, a lot of those different things got us bickering because it's like we can do more together than we can apart. We can lift if we all lift together. And so as long as we murmuring, complaining, and going against each other, we can't bring all of our resources, our time, talent, and treasure together. You can go, you get what I'm saying? So we, we have to be able to come together because somebody else don't have it all, but they got a piece that I need. You get what I'm saying? And she have a piece that I need. So it, we need to be able to 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 come together. But that's interesting. You said that the, the real college, 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 the model, model about college. And I'm not against college. I work out of school, um, uh, high school. But the trades is, is gone. Right. All of them are gone. Automotive. We had automotive coming up. We had wood shop. We had printing press. We had a whole bunch of stuff. So, you know, if the, if the bottom fall out and you can't find a job. You can eat because you know how to work on a car. You can eat because you can hang up drywall. You can eat because you can run wire in the building. You know what I mean? But if you don't have that, you're at the mercy of whoever's going to hire you. You know what I mean? And so that's that's pretty much amazing. But what about this this the, the bickering with, within uh, Israel? That's the question number one of two, and then we're going to get out of here. But what about that bickering? You know, it, would that hold us uh, back as a whole? And then I think, too, they, they get us to not trust each other. You know, I don't know if you've seen that Judas and the Black Messiah movie. You've seen that movie? Yes. Yes, I saw it. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, some people are going to always be on payroll. You know, like, look, you can send me in there and to, to spy it out and mm -hmm. sabotage it or whatever. So, I mean, and sometimes you can't even notice. Like, oh, man, he went for a long time without even being being, being sought out. Like, they thought that he was really in there, part of it. He he walked the walk, he talked the talk, he he did the cultural thing, he did everything, but he was reporting to somebody else. He was doing something else, and that movie is very very interesting about the Fred Hampton or whatever. But I'm like these little things like this. It seems like uh, hurt the community, hurt hurt our community a lot. So we got to make sure we stay in, in prayer because sometimes you don't even know. You know what I'm saying? Who's friend or foe when it comes to those things? But we have been pitted against each other, and, and so we have to make sure we come uh, back, back, back together. We have been pitted against each other. You know. Um, also, with the awakening, you're learning culture, and so some people might say, "Well, this is important. Well, that is important. Well, this part that the Most High showed me is important. We have to be able to be able to to." Uh, come back together when it comes to that. But you had this shirt that said death to dogma. <laughs> and you also said this on, I think it was a Thursday pop-up. Dogma externally places its own understanding on a cultural group to copy it as to cope, to copy it as religion and uh, pose it on others. So I guess I'm, I guess I'm in two different places. I got some actually two questions, but what about that death to dog? But what about uh, identity? What about uh, uh, Israelite culture? It's not really, really defined. You know what I'm saying as far as with the awakening. So people uh, champion this part, but not the other part. You, you get what I'm saying? So we're learning to be Israel. We're learning what's important. We're learning uh, dietary laws. You know what I mean? At the same time, a lot of dogmas in us that we that we that we're getting rid of. When you say come out of her, come out of her, my people. You know what I mean? And do not partake uh in the things of Babylon. Come out. You know what I mean? So we're we're, we're learning. We, we it's not that it's a new thing, but it's a restoration of an old thing. You know what I mean? An old old custom in our culture. So what would you say about um when people are awakening as far as Israeli uh, uh, not Israeli, but uh Hebrew Hebraic culture, what's important um and as far as Hebraic culture? Awesome. Um, so I, I think I understand uh, the question you're asking. Um, when I did the uh, death to dogma thing, uh, the purpose of that is looking at the definition of dogma is a principle or set of principle, rules, guidelines, etc. that is laid down by an authoritative entity, i.e. a church, to be held as incontrovertibly true. Incontrovertibly means you do not argue it, you do not question it, you do not, you know, go against it. You accept mm. it as a reality. Okay. Despite okay. whether or not you fully understand it, 
despite whether or not it's truly applicable, it does not matter. So when there are entities and a church is just one example of that, or religious body, uh, body politic is one example of that, is laying down the way you need to believe. You got to remember, the religious institution that has held the most control over the world resources is the Roman Catholic Church because it transfers mm. the, the Roman um, power, authority, rule, et cetera, over into a religious system, right? That allowed it to maneuver its way in different societies as a religious organization, right? Um, and as stemming out of that in the Protestant Reformation, a lot of the ideals that were shared with the Roman Catholic Church still held true in the Protestant Reformation circles. Now, wow. when you get people of African descent, and we wow. identify as a subgroup within that African descent uh, title as Israelites, are being brought over here to the Americas and indoctrinated. The form of religion that we get are dogmas that is designed to hold us back spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. How do mm. you take all of these alpha male? Black, strong alpha males mm -hmm. and keep them from rebelling. Wow. You know how difficult that should be to make these strong alpha males do what you want them to do? And all you have is an overseer and a gun? Trust me, they're willing to sustain a couple of shots to beat you behind if they have to. So you have to find some other means to keep them docile. You have to find some other means. So many people think. And um, there's a book that I have on, on memoirs of slaves. And they did an interview with a lot of slaves um, after the Civil War. Um, some people who had history as being slaves and so forth and asked them a, a myriad of questions in regards to their experiences. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of us think that slavery, the way they control this is just by beating us, flogging us, castrating us, you know, creating breeding farms where they would take one fertile female and have all types of black males from all types of all places of the U.S. and the Caribbean and South America come and just lay with her and then take her child and then sell her child to the highest bidder. And she never has a relationship with the father of that child. All these things that we're thinking that is happening now, all of it stems back to a history. That's why I wow. said we never had any way to repair this. But I say that to say the, the way when they talk that they got them to be so docile is by getting them to engage in religion and mm. told them things and said it was incontrovertibly true. When we say to you that, yes, you are inferior to Japheth because wow. you are from Ham, and we know that Ham was cursed. No, 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 no. Canaan, he had the consequence, not Ham, by the way, but that's neither here nor there. If they're telling you these things and you're accepting it as incontrovertibly, incontrovertibly true, and they have taking away your spirituality and giving you a watered down version and told you that the only way you can survive on this foreign soil, because remember, we didn't have access to ships to go sail back if we needed to. We didn't have access to any money, any resources, any guns. We didn't have none of that. So we're, we're behind enemy lines and we're forced to live out a life that we didn't choose for our own. And the only way to survive it is to listen to their rules or the dogmas which they've given us for us to navigate a society that was not built with us in mind. Wow. So the dogmas that have been instilled upon us, now we're not talking about the overall dogmas that is there in the church system. And I'm not saying all churches, I'm not speaking about Christianity or anything like that. I'm just saying church bodies, right? There are dogmas that, are, that were created specifically for slaves within the religious circles on a more minute level. And then there's dogma that's created on the general level to keep people in control. And what happens is if you accept something as being incontrovertibly true, Without mm -hmm. asking questions to say whether or not, wait, is this is this the way it was intended? Is this what I'm supposed to, if, if you're not questioning those things and you're just accepting it, because it even happens in the Israelite community, right? People are groomed under other people and they listen to what their mores, their teachers, their congregation leaders say to them. Uh, and not saying that's wrong. I'm not, I'm not advocating for anybody to rebel in that sense. What I'm saying is you have to be able to notice to be true for yourself. And if you don't do that, what happens is a lot of the dogma has also created factions amongst us. And when you have a fracticidal war going on where you have different people of our communities that's identifying as different sects and cannot find a way to come to common ground or what's called the common denominator. Now we have a situation where there's continual 
uh, butting, contention, etc. So how do you remove that? Well, dogma, understanding dogmas is one way because if I learn that the thing that I'm pushing is not something that was created with me in mind or not the original intention of the author of a particular text that I'm following, then I got to realize, like, well, wait, then why is this here? What's the providence or origin of it? Who created it? Why was it created? And what is its effects over time? Doing a historical mm. analysis of it from the time of its implementation until the end result, which is here today. What is the result of this particular teaching? How much fruit has been produced by it? How much damage has it caused? How much restrictions has it imposed? See, Christianity talks a lot about legalism, but they have a form of legalism themselves that they also impose on others. That's another conversation altogether. But again, I want to I want to keep things light because I don't I don't want them to <laughs> right because I am a guess. Um, so removing the dogmas is just one way to get us back to our culture. If we keep debating religious things, we'll never come together. And again, remember, everybody's not going to come together regardless. Okay. However, we can get a good amount of people together if we learn how to do so. If we go back to culture, not religion, what's the difference? I'm going to give you a good, a good example of culture versus religion, right? Really simple. The dietary law, which is in Leviticus chapter 11, right? I did a whole lecture, lecture on this in 2019 when I was in New Orleans, Louisiana, right? And what I wanted to show people is that the dietary law is a practical system to allow the culture to stay in harmony with the ecology of the environment in which they're living. Therefore, a template was laid so that way the people in the culture know what are animals that are viable for us to eat and consume that has a high reproduction rate, which means you can eat it and you'll, it'll never go extinct, and that its functions is not going to deter or destroy the hierarchy of the ecology within that environment. Here's a great example of that. Certain birds you don't eat because those birds, they keep the vermin count down in your community. When you mm. have excess vermin in your community, they spread disease. They're vectors. They're the intermediary to allow viruses and bacteria to proliferate towards people. They eat your food, they damage your goods, they do all types of stuff. But if you're eating all the birds that are responsible in your ecology of the environment in which you live in, that is designed to keep the vermin count down, guess what's going to happen? Your vermin count is going to explode. Then you're going to have plagues, you know, like the Black Plague in Europe, and disease, and damaged wow. goods, and spoil granaries, etc. So you don't eat that bird. You leave it alone. Then there are birds that you don't eat because some birds, they lay eggs in a nest. The eggs crack open. The birdlings, they're hungry. They want food. The mother feeds them. After a short period of time, those birdlings develop strength in their wings. They fly out, and they're good. However, there are some birds that require the parent all the way into adulthood. Hmm. And if you kill the parents off, the young will not survive. Wow. Therefore, you leave those birds alone. You don't eat them. And then there are animals in the environment whose job is to assist with the decomposition process and the filtration of trash naturally that occurs in the environment. Pigs were useful for that. Therefore, the scavengers you don't eat because when you eat it, guess what they saw what happened? People was getting sick. They were dying. They was getting diseases. So you leave that animal alone. But this animal you can eat because because it has four stomachs, it can process all the food that it eats. It primarily has one particular diet, and therefore the meat in it is not poisonous to you, so you can consume it. However, they did not eat meat every day in the environment because if they eat meat every day, you won't have any animals to eat, I mean, to, to, to live in the environment. So they only mm. ate a couple of times during the month in order for their flocks to be sustained, and they usually only ate meat during festive times. If a family Man. member coming from town, they haven't seen them in years, like Abraham did when the three strangers came to visit him, they went and they slaughtered the animal and they ate meat. When it's a feast day, they go and they eat meat. When it's the new moon, they, they slaughter the animal and they eat meat. Only through festive time, because if you are a pastoralist and you have 30 animals in your flock and you eat meat every day, you'd have no flock. <laughs> wow. There's nothing there. So everything was practical to keep you in harmony with the ecology of the environment in which you lived. So the animals you do eat will be able to be sustained over time, meaning they reproduce fast enough so that way you will be able to have food and other forms of sustenance. 
Other animals may not reproduce as fast. Other animals have other checks and balances within the ecology, so you leave them alone. Fish that was in the sea were able to reproduce very fast, especially the type of fish that they ate in the Mediterranean Sea and those that was in the Jordan River. Okay. However, there are animals in there without fins and scales that have a particular role of filtering the water by having other dudes. If you have too much detritus, which is which is like waste buildup, your mm -hmm. water becomes polluted. You cannot eat the water. However, there are animals that are designed to eat that. So it's not like okay, let's debate whether or not chicken is is uh, food to eat. I mean, people debate over. It. It's like, yo, culturally, let's look at a couple of things. Let's look at the material culture. Material culture is the archaeological items that was left behind by the people that wrote the book. If we go into then in, in 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 that environment and we look to see that there are chicken bones there, how do we know that they ate the chicken bones? Well, there's different variants. Chicken is a form of a wild fowl, but it has been domesticated. Why? It has been domesticated for several reasons. Number one, to keep the insect population down. So they kept them in close quarters so they can primarily eat insects and any grit because they need it for the gizzard in order to grind food. And then number two, to domesticate them to be more docile so they can eat them. Chickens, and they're, when they're naturally grown around, people don't run away from you. Wild fowls will run away from you. But if you domesticate them, you keep them around you. So when it's time to slaughter them, they ain't going to go nowhere. Wow. They're, they're being coming relied upon you for their survival. So we saw that the actual size of the animal, when they domesticated, their bone structure, their muscular skeletal system gets much smaller because they are not, uh, uh, they are not um, being affected by the same stresses in a natural environment because you are protecting them. So they ain't got to run as fast. They ain't got to fly as high because you're protecting them. They're, mm. being, they're secure. There's no predators attacking them. So therefore, over time, they develop into much smaller animals. Number two, they become more docile because they become more used to humans. Therefore, you can manipulate them more than you can a wild fowl. Number three, when people ate these animals, they typically ate within the home. So we found bones within the home. Number four, we know they ate them when they were in the home because people of ancient times like to gnaw or chew on bone marrow. Man, and then there's ways that they cut the meat as well. So we see flint knives, and we know how flint knives can fracture bone when you're trying to cut it in half. All these things we can see and determine just from the material culture of how the people live that they ate chicken. That's number one. Number two, the question is, did they have chicken, even have chicken within that time period? <laughs> what if that animal didn't even exist at that time? And you arguing, debating, a religious thing, saying God said this and God said that. Wait, wait, wait. what about the practicality of the culture? Why hmm. did the Most High allow the culture to do these things in that environment? The key thing is that environment. You must examine that environment. You must understand the geography of the environment, the topography of the environment. You understand the hills and you have to understand the valleys. You have to understand their proximity to certain water sources, their proximity to cisterns, wells, and springs. You must understand the architecture of the home, the courtyard system, the four room houses. All of these things, when you start learning how the people actually lived and how that way of life reflected in what we have in the scriptures, then you begin to understand that we're debating and arguing about religious things that other groups should be arguing because these are our ancestors, this was their culture, and when we learn it from that vantage point, we can remove the hindrances that keep us apart. That's number one, mm. as far as the dogma is concerned. That's why we say death to dogma because dogma is just a way of disguising the culture mm. Mm. for you because religion takes the things that benefits it and it taboos the things that does not benefit it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully that was enough in regards to the government. But now, how do we apply that to coming together? Well, if we look at our communities, there are common things that we all need. Mm -hmm. All of us. So we could debate and argue right now with YouTube. As soon as we turn the computer off, we still got to go out to poverty. Soon we got to go out to gunplay in our city, especially Chicago. They lost over, they got 90 people hit. Yeah. 90 people hit. Yeah. And one weekend over July 4th weekend and 17 people killed, if I'm not mistaken. So you still got to face gunfire. You still got to face crime, drugs. Uh, you got to face predatory loans that you're getting afflicted with every day. How about we look into our Torah culture, find something that was used there that yielded repeatable results and mm -hmm. find a way to contemporize it. So that way it can fix results in our community. And if we spend more time focusing on that to fix societal ills, you'll see there'll be less differences that we have. Woo! Contemporized Torah culture. Wow, man. Mm, mm, mm. Man, oh man, that is some powerful stuff. <laughs> We're gonna have to table the rest of that stuff. That's that's some heavy stuff, brother. Yeah, because you're right. I mean, 
man, that's so crazy because they say, man, it doesn't matter. We all want to Yeshua. You know, it don't matter. You know, he didn't come to save skin colors. He come to save souls. And don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. Just preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. So it's like it made me say, what is the gospel? What is this that we're preaching and teaching and keeping? And I'm not against the gospel of Yahushua HaMashiach at all about when I say that. But I'm saying just blank everything out and just preach the gospel. You know what I mean? And so um, it's, it's it's a lot, man. It's layers. And like you said, the, the healing that needs to take place in our community, and, and I'm going to even pray tonight, man, but it's a lot of healing that needs to take place in our community. Um, it's a lot of trauma, right? Trauma in Hollywood is a billion-dollar industry, right? So they went from slave movie to trauma movie. You know, we running down the street scared and crying and no resolve, and that's like, well, man, that was a terrible movie. <laughs> now, you know what? Just to interject uh, respectfully, um, yes, sir. brother, is slavery is still happening psychologically by means of slavery movies. Slavery movies are designed to do two things. So right? if, you still, if you watch a slavery movie, you still could be uh, a slave mentally? Yes, because it's designed, okay. to do, designed to do two things. Number one, lower your self-esteem as a, as a black person. It does. Right. Number one or number two, frustrate you enough to act out and give an excuse for them to create laws that continue to keep us oppressed. Oh, wow. So it's going to evoke one of those two emotions. Either one mm -hmm. is going to affect you internally. Some people, when they watch me, say, I can't watch 12 years a slave because I cried so much. It made me feel so bad. It did that yeah. to my ancestors. Why they do us, do, do us like that? And the second thing is outrage. Oh, my God. I'm mad. I'm angry. I hate yeah. the white man. Let me go out there and do something crazy. So yeah. either way. They're still using it as a means of controlling you emotionally. So either one, you act out and then they call you a black identity extremist and now use that as a means to create laws to keep us suppressed. Or number two, hurt your self-esteem so that way you mentally or subliminally believe that you are still a second class citizen because they never show you the history of these black people before they got over here. They don't show you that. They're not going to show you that. They just show you our state when we're here. They just open it up with us as slaves. The same yeah. thing they teach our kids in public school. Yeah. They started off as a slave. Same thing is happening. So they can find ways. Hey, I can't call a person a, 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 the N word. And I'm not going to curse on here. The N word <laughs> publicly, but I could put it in a movie and we could call them N words up and down. Yep. I can't slap and beat and rape a black woman inside today, but I could do it in the movies. It's a oh. way of inflicting the same agony and pain that those ancestors face on you today. Make your Damn. skin crawl watching it. You know, you can't sleep yeah. at night. You get bothered. You feel affected. They, they, it affects movies you. Movies are designed to control a population the same way that folk tales were designed to control population in times past. It's nothing has changed. It's just being done in a more covert way that you, most of us are not privy of. So I'm sorry, my brother. I just wanted to interject and say that. Yeah. But you know what it made me think, too, about the whole when you were talking about the chicken as far as um the dependency. We are the consumers. We're not we, we we consume more than we produce, right? And so, and we we are real dependent on, you know, and we you know we trust. And it's like, well, man, a lot of this stuff it never changed. It just was repackaged different. All right, we're not gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna change this. We're gonna repackage it as something else. Because oh man, we had a, a black president, and then it's 2021, and that happened way back in the days, you know. Uh, so, and it's a new day now, and we're more diverse, and we're more accepting of, of other people and their culture. So, man, you're just paranoid, and it ain't even like that no more, and you're just blah, 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 and they, they gaslight you to thinking, well, man, well, maybe maybe it is changing. Maybe I just don't have a, a, a positive outlook on life or, you know, whatever. You know what I mean? And so, but it's like, no, it's, it's still there. It's still there. I watched film from 68. I watch film from 65. I watch film from 43. I'd be like, that is going on to this day in 2001. Some of those things, a lot of those things. But a lot, a lot of it is more covert than over in your face operations. And so, man, we do have the, I like what you put right there. What you just said right here, contemporized Torah culture. Everything that we need is back to him. You know what I mean? He, and he loves us. You know what I mean? And he's not going to let no other no other God be a God over him. You know what I mean? And so he he wants us to come back to him and, 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 and focus back to him. But a lot of times with the awakening, we say, okay, I know who I am. I'm the tribe, you know, tribe of Judah. 
possibly Benjamin and Levi, but Tribe of Judah, bam, I'm a lead. We still got these issues psychologically in our hearts, in our mind, in our will, in our emotion that he has to clean, he has to deliver us from. He's a lot of these different things that he has to deliver us from because hurt people hurt people. We go out there and we going out there and we, we teaching the wrong thing and people can't even go, go get a hamburger because you be screaming. And I understand the frustration, but that's why we need that Ruach HaKodesh. We out there screaming at folk. You know, they can't even get into the door to get a hamburger good. You know what I mean? Condemning folk. And it's like, well, man, you, you got to re, re, re-evaluate and re-understand what's going on with that. And I like that because a lot of times we read the text and say, well, don't get mad at me. It's in the Bible. Okay. But what was going on during that time culturally, systematically? What was going on during that time? You know, as opposed to now, but I like, like, I like that when I say contemporize, contemporize it, because we have to bring it today in two thousand uh, and one, and I saw a lot of people they can't locate it, so they try to just okay, law of Moses instead of the finished work of Yahusha. The law of Moses is not; it's not wrong with it, you know what I mean. But being able to, to embrace the finished work of Yahusha. So this is the last thing, man, because I know you got to go, but and uh, but 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 but. What is a difference between um, what what are a few other differences between worshiping on Shabbat and Sunday service worship? I know that's a hot seat question, but I'm like, but what what will be one of the main difference between like what was what was taken when in your awakening? What did you take with you from what you learned uh, in the church and Christianity community as opposed to to, to now, and I can ask. We can close with that question, um, right there. What was taken? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Um, so you asked me about um, uh, Sunday service worship or mm-hmm. Sunday worship service and Sabbath observ- observation, right? Observance, right? So um, it, this is um, a very interesting topic. Matter of fact. Uh, I would like to share a resource if anybody's interested in reading more on this subject matter. Um, if you allow me, uh, give me one second, let me pull it up. Yes, sir. And um, I'll share on the screen in case anybody wants to look more into that subject matter. It's a great mm-hmm. book that's written on it. Uh, let me find it. Yeah, because I think a lot of times when people, you know, hey, man, you know, I guess this is way how you how you present it. But you broke that whole thing down with the birds. It's so amazing. Hey, man, we don't eat this because they depend on it. They they adopt their parents to adulthood. So if you wipe them out, then they don't make it. Man, that's clear as day. You know what I mean? So it's more than just rules and thou shalt not. It's it's a it's it's a reason why everything is done. But exactly. but I think a lot of times folks just say, Oh, well, man, I'm fine. You're trying to come, you're trying to change my day, you're trying to change my diet, <laughs> you're trying to change my this, and I'm doing and I'm work, I'm walking in the spirit, I'm I've floated, you know. It's like if people don't see nothing quote unquote wrong with it. Uh, then they'd be like, "Well, man, I'm fine. Why? What, what are you trying to? You trying to add and take away? Uh, you know." And I have some people say, "Uh, uh, man, we got to pray for Brother B. Man, he lost. Man, you know." And they take the the the, uh, the Galatians scripture out of content. You know, say, uh, silly Galatians who have bewitched you to to fall away from what was taught to to what's going on now. You know what I mean? And so. But anyway, but this, this what's, what's this right No, here? I, I have no problem. Um, I'll, I'll wrap it up with you in a few. But I want to address that to you, brought that relation scripture. But um, first, I want to show this book here, if anybody's interested. It's called From Sabbath to Lord's Day, a Biblical, Historical, mm. and Theological Investigation by D.A. Carson. All right. Um, I'll, I'm gonna send you, I'll send you the book, brother, so you, you can okay. take a look at it. Um, but this book here is going to give you more details so you know historically how things change. We know that in the uh, Roman Catholic catechism, um, there's a question and answer in there. And one of the question is, you know, how did the, how did the uh, Sabbath change to the Lord's day and the credit is taken or, or the credit is uh, given to the actual church body that decides that they were the ones that changed the Sabbath from the Jewish seventh day of the week to the first day of week, which is the day in which our Lord rose. And this is the argument for the Lord's day, quote unquote, right? That we find in uh, a book in the Bible, such as the book of Revelation, which they claim is the Lord's day. And they also claim that because Paul collected money on the first day of the week where the brothers came to break bread, that that was some form of worship. 
Doxology, any form of doxology or words related to doxology is not mentioned anywhere in that passage of Corinthians. But people use it as a proof set to say this is why this is why we worship on Sunday today, because they came together and broke bread on Sunday. I, OK, that's that has nothing to do with the day of rest or anything like that. You understand what I'm saying? Um, but then when you when you brought up Galatians and I'll bring up Galatians real quick as well. But this this book, if anybody's interested in, you can buy the book or reach out to me. and I'll make sure you get access to it. Um, for my library. But if you go to um, if you go to Galatians, go to Galatians and uh, deal with that passage. And I'm going to bring you to Acts 15 um, real quick, because Galatians is in response to Paul, his um, encounter uh, with the individuals that he bumped into, uh, meaning the, the um, actual leaders of the church that he bumped into or the ecclesia, the calls out ones that he bumped into when he was um, in Jerusalem and has Jerusalem Council. Right. So if we look here in um, in Galatians chapter one, um, you see here where he says, um, for you have heard of my former way of life in Judaism, how severely I persecuted the church of the most high and tried to destroy it. I, am in, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. What did he say there? Tell me if you point, point in verse 14. Let me know what stands out to you in verse 14. What stands out there? Can you make you can make that bigger or no? Oh yeah, yeah. Let me do that. Because it might be small. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, there we go. So in verse 14, he says, I was advancing in, and they put the word Judaism there, beyond uh -huh. many of my contemporaries, and was what? Extremely, Extremely zealous, zealous for the law of Moses. The traditions of my fathers. That's what he said. He was zealous for the traditions of my father. Check it out. Mm. Let me show you the definition of legalism. All right here's the definition of legalism. Because everybody thinks that Paul was against the law. Paul was against legalism. This is what legalism is. All right. If you do a quick search for it in an Oxford dictionary, let me share my my other screen. All right. It says. Excessive adherence to law or formula, dependence on moral law rather than on personal religious faith, right? And that is the Christian redefinition of legalism in the English sense when it comes to the traditionally English translations of the Bible. The key thing is an excessive adherence to law or formula. This is what Paul was practicing when he was in quote unquote Judaism at that time, which would have been what's called second temple Judaism. The Judaism that arose during the time of the building and establishment of the second temple. When the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD, you had a new form of Judaism come about, which was called rabbinic Judaism, which is a form of Judaism that existed without the presence of the second temple, right? So there was a degree of oral laws that was preserved in Second Temple Judaism that made its way into Rabbinic Judaism that then in 200 CE made its way into the Mishnah and then made its way into conversations and commentary in the Gemara, which then makes it the compendium of what's called the Talmud. And mm. these conversations and legal rulings, the Mishnah is pretty much a, a case will be brought up. So if somebody says, hey, is it legal for me to bring outside things in my home on the Sabbath? So there will be a ruling on that because it's not explicit in the scriptures, a ruling on it. That's what we call halakhic law, which is a form of law by a religious body of elders or elected officials that will rule over the matter to determine whether something should be an ordinance or a statute that lines up side by side with scripture. An example of that, when Yeshua was with his disciples and they went to go visit somebody, they started eating food. They said, whoa, wait, these guys didn't wash their hands ritually. Well, in the oral tradition, there is a way that you're supposed to wash your hands before you eat food. But that's nowhere in Torah. That is called legalism. When you are creating your own ordinances and statutes and give it the weight of law that people must oblige themselves to because a religious body ruled on it, again, a dogma that then separates people from the liberty that they have and who's called mm -hmm. Yeshua because he taught the law perfectly. Hmm. All he wow. did was hit Midrash. Let's see what Midrash is. 
Because anybody that's familiar with rabbinic Judaism, they know what Midrash is, right? What is Midrash? An ancient commentary on part of the Hebrew scriptures attached to the biblical text, the earliest Midrashim, came from the second century AD, although much of its content is older. Let me see if I can grab a much uh, better interpretation. Midrash is biblical exegesis by ancient Judaic authorities using a mode of interpretation prominent in the Talmud. So Midrash is equivalent to the Christian form of exegesis. How do you seek out the intended meanings of the text? And there are different levels of meaning, four different levels that's identified in Judaism that's there in the text. But simply it is an interpretative act seeking the answers to religious questions, both practical and theological, by plumbing the meaning of words, phrases, and clauses within the Torah. So all Yeshua was doing was, for example, Matthew Yahoo chapter 5, performing mirash on things that show up in the Torah. He was not changing the law. He was giving you the mm. best exposition and application during their period of time on how the law should operate. Here's an example. The law says, eye for an eye, two for a tooth. If you kill my son, I get to kill yours. However, the Torah also says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Whoa, hold on. So now you have a dichotomy there where you can legally go and get mm. revenge, but also you have the opportunity to show love, turn the cheek, and be merciful towards your neighbor. Why? Because you think back and the reservoir of memories of your ancestors when the times when they grumbled, the times when they complained, the times when they rebelled and rose up when the Most High should have put them to death. But however, he decided to scale back his judgment. Mm. That does not wow. mean that he can divvy out judgment like David should have died for committing adultery and conspiring mm -hmm. to murder, which is equal to murder, which are two capital offenses. He should have died. However, because of the mercy of the character of Yah, he stayed off the judgment. So therefore, wow. Yeshua was simply saying that in this time of our captivity, we have bittering, we have arguing, we have factions mm, come on, that man. are against each other and in a power and empire that's above us. That is torturing us. That is, uh, 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 you know, putting us against each other. That is restricting our cultural observances, etc. It's not time to get vengeance across each other. Just like here in our communities today, it is not time to get vengeance against one another because we have a simple misunderstanding, grievance, or some kind of issue. Great. We have to take the high road because we're not in a sovereign state when matters can be dealt much differently because we are the ones over in power. He was teaching them an exposition out of Torah about the weightier matters of the law. That's what he said to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. Yes, you tithe come and deal a mint. However, you have neglected. He said, these you ought to have done without neglecting the rest. There are two forms of the law. There are the ordinances and then there's the heart aspect of the law. He was telling them, now is not the time for you to beef amongst one another. Even though you are entitled to vengeance, I say to you, take the high road. Why? Because Torah mm. also validates him telling people to take the high road. He's not changing nothing because everything that he alluded to in the Torah and then expounding upon, I can show you in Torah where it's at. When he says, love thy neighbor, he said, they ask him, what's the greatest commandment? He says, the first one is Shema, Matthew 12. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. The second is the same. Love thy neighbor as you love thyself. Devarim mm -hmm. tells you to love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And Devarim or Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Leviticus chapter 18 tells you to love your neighbor as yourself. This is not new principles. These are already in the Old Testament, so-called Old Testament. All he was doing was expounding upon the other aspects of the law. Key word, I said law that the people have neglected because of the excessive adherence to the law by means of legalistic customs that then shroud the law in its initial purpose. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, Moses says, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Paul didn't come up with the circumcision of your heart. Hmm. Very idea. That came from Moses. However, it is the weightier matters of the law that was being overlooked because of the current captive condition. Wow. I'm done. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Ooh, man, that's, I'm, I'm excited, man. I'm, I'm, I'm just, man. <laughs> uh, 
That's such a blessing, man. That's such a blessing. Good gracious, man. Man, you just got to say lie to that, man. Man, that's, that's some powerful stuff, man. Uh, man, because we are we we in a strange land for real. Man, we need to turn to the most high and seek his face. And, you know, man, why do the heathen rage and come up against the most high is anointed and conspire and confederate against us, man? But 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 we have we don't got a hawk, we don't got an army, we got the most high. <laughs> so they got an army, they got a hawk, we got the most high. <laughs> and I think that whole thing, man, we're getting back to the most high and being able to cry out is a, is a form of worship and it's a weapon. You know what I mean? If you look all throughout the story, man, I just want you just to walk around seven times and then and then praise me and I'm going to do the rest. You know what I'm saying? And it's just, I mean, I'm not saying that we're not being active in whatever, but but being, being specific and tentative to what he says do, and we have to do that, you know? And I believe with the scattering, came the scattering of mindsets and scattering of man that's why we all over the place so i salute you let me talk about me brothers from the like the new york area i salute them because there's so much going on man and uh coming up in the hip-hop culture we had a lot of influence <clears throat> on uh from from uh the uh the seven and the crescent and the, and the you know the, the the sons of guys and nerves and the clans 13x and it's all in our music and you know, and you know, we listen to all these different things coming up. You know, and and, and even even the, the, everything. You know, what I'm saying the, the noble draw I lead and the Wapians. You got so to be like, man, I'm gonna be tour base, and I'm and I'm gonna stay focused on the Most High. Is is is, is a blessing and a gift in itself. You know what I mean? And it, to 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 be focused like that. You know what I mean? In the midst of everything that's going on. You know what I mean? Um, not just saying to the unknown God, to the unknown Father, but to to actually know Him. It's just a blessing, man. It's really, really a blessing, and I and I, I salute you. Amen. I agree. And I'm just like, man. I just, man. We definitely got to get you back on. Um, if you got any of your uh your mods, or anybody that want to put anything in the chat, they can. If not, then I can put some stuff in the chat and, and let us know how we can get in contact with you, man. That was this is a blessing, man. This is a blessing. For awesome. real. And vice versa, my brother. I enjoy your platform as well. You have a, light, a lot of insightful guests on here that you speak with, and even things that you put forth yourself, I think is uh, extremely knowledgeable and easy to digest, right? Um, that can help the average brother or sister in looking for direction and, and understanding things that need to be done in the community. Um, mm. And I appreciate you for that. So the least I could do uh, as a token of that appreciation is be able to contribute to the dialogue or the discussion. Right. Um, and, and and do so in a way that's that's with respect, that's that's proper protocol and, and, and knowing that, you know, whatever I share, I'll be able to receive in return. Right. I'm a, I'm a student before I teach her, before I teach anything. And, um, you know, the the worst thing that can happen with me in a discussion is that I learned something, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, but we have to be humble enough to know that sometimes we don't know everything. And sometimes the greatest wisdom can come from the un most unexpected places. Right. So this is why we should never count people out until we have actually heard their story. Right. And, and what they have to say. So if more brothers and sisters took that high road um, and, and understanding these things, I think we would be able to put aside a lot of differences and actually at least build something that is common amongst us that can help us with the society ills that we face day to day. And I believe that when we read in Deuteronomy, I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, Jeremiah chapter 29 um, in regards to seeking a piece of the city, if we can focus more of our Torah culture on that um, and be able to alleviate more and more issues, you know, because you got to think about it. The, the reason why there's a lot of contention, and it's the last thing I'm going to say in our communities, because of societal pressures that we face each and every day. You know, a lot of times we have, you know, situations where we have spousal issues or we have economic issues or, you know, we have issues where you can't buy the house that you want or get the car that you want or issues where you have health, uh, you know, um, in, impairments and things. Like that. Because of all of these amalgamation and variety of issues, it, it affects the way that you socialize with other people, right? And it predisposes you for an argument because you already got stress and issues and all this other stuff. And that that is taken with you into your <coughs> argument. 
but we can focus more on resolving these societal ills within our community. We can alleviate our brothers and sisters of this baggage that they carry in the conversations. And that will be less fuel to the fire that they're experiencing internally. And then in the process, they'll be more willing to yield for the greater good, right? It will take time and it may or may not happen in our lifetime. See, the work that you perform, you can't expect to get everything out of it in your lifetime. If you do, you have short vision. Right. So you have to anticipate 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years around when I die, how is this thing going to keep going? How is it going to keep affecting people positively? Right. How is it going to continue to lay down a foundation for others to build off of? That is how big your vision has to be. It has to be wow. what the scripture says, a prudent man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, Same your man. grandchildren. When they become adults, will they be self-sufficient? Will they be autonomous? Will be able, be able to know that culture is the thing that is the glue to bind them together. Will they know the the proper, have the proper the corrective lenses to interpret the field of vision that is in their reality, right? Are we equipping them with these things so that we can give our gener uh, next generation coming up, which is our children, then at least we can prepare them to remove some of those walls and hindrances that we had in dealing with other people within our community. And I yield. Man. And you know, even I, even when I see the elders, man, I salute them, the ones who are, have wisdom, and, and and the ones who don't have wisdom. Because I'm like, man, you made it all the way to 80, you know, 90 years old, 75 years old, man. You know what I mean? Uh, that's man, salute to you. You know what I mean? And some of them deal with different things. I had a lot of alcoholism and on both sides of my family, from my grandfathers and stuff like that. But 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 um, for them to be able to to be able to make it and tell a story and you know, I used to go into the to the Mickey D's or whatever, and I see the old the old men sitting there, or to go in the barbershop and they just sitting there laughing. It's, I'm like, they wasting time. And now, as I get older, I'm like, no, they having the time of their life, man. They're reflecting, they sharing. You know, they they teaching. You know what I mean? And and that, that's that gap got to be restored as far as with the youth. They got the strength, but the but but the, but a lot of the elders got the wisdom. So if if, if they can submit and humble themselves to the to the elder, um, then they can get the information and, and go with it with, with the strength and not wait till you are old, broke down, you know, oh man, I, I understand now you can't really do nothing because you, some of us, because we'd be older and beat down and broke down. Not me, I'm mid-age, but I'm just saying. So that, that, that has to come together. And he's trying to restore that family, that Mishpuha, that family, that corner near, that fellowship with him, with, uh, with us and him. He is restoring that family element. And that's what needs to be done. And um, we go to everybody else for aid. We need to go right to the most high. We have to go, we have to go back to the most high. He used nations, he used people. The king's heart is in his hand. He can turn it any which way that he that he see fit. But 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 we have to go to him and and, and you know, because it's a lot of trolls and horses out there, and we just want to be loved and accepted so much that anything they give us, like here you go. And I'd be like, ah, that's not man, you hating. No, I'm not hating, man. Just, just, just walk circumspectly, man. Cause I, I think that's a trap. I don't know if that's for us, man. You know, you know what I mean. But you've been in a, in a place of, 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 beat down for so long and trauma and drama for so long. Any aid, it looks like it's a good, that you know, abusive aid. You know what I'm saying? It's like me. You don't have to be abused like that. You know what I mean? And and even even in Africa, the continent of Africa right now, how, how China is rebuilding stuff and building roads and bridges and i mean so they looking like man you know come on in come on in but i'm like man what is the price on the back end of that you know so i just say man just walk circumspectly and watch you know what i mean and actually the most high for discernment who's who's really for us and who's got another ulterior motive you know what i mean but uh man thank you man this is this is it's just off the hook, man. So I know, I know you, you might, oh, I'm a guest, so I'm gonna tone it down. But this is grown man conversations dealing with the elephants in the room. And I used to always get in trouble because, mm -hmm. man, what about that? What, man, look, don't worry about that. Do as I say, not as I do. Don't ask me about that. You're gonna get penalized. You ask me about it again. So I was always that one kid who, you know, man, what's going on with that? Why has, why has, why is that taboo to talk about touch? So that's what the whole short elephant man came from. Grown man conversation dealing with elephants in the room. That's dealing with our Hebrew culture. So man, it, awesome. Um, man. 
So uh, we went a little bit over. We went a little bit over the seventy minutes that I promised to 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 your, to your team, man. But uh, I thank you, man. I gotta have you back on. I, I think we're full right now. I can't even ask you the last three questions, man. So we got to get you back on, man, and um, and talk about that about the health, the healing, the neurology, and a different thing like that. And I heard your testimony, and I heard you sharing about the different people in your family who who had different cancers and things like that. And you was trying to share with them and put them on game and have an emergency plan and all these different things. And, you know, we got our family like, oh man, oh, you know, go on, sit down. Or, I, I got it. Oh, I'm cool. You know what I mean? You can continue to pray for them and ask the most high to drop some wisdom to them or some knowledge to them. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, um, I, I would like to say to everybody that's watching out there, Thank you for supporting Elephant Man Podcast. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe. Uh, hit thumbs up on this video. Go back, check out the archives. Hit thumbs up on those videos as well. Uh, thank you, uh, my brother, for allowing me an opportunity to uh, grace uh, your platform and be able to contribute to the dialogue uh, that uh, you know was designed to edify the community. Uh, I appreciate this podcast for dealing with the elephant in the room as adults. Um, and doing so with class, but at the same time, uh, being straightforward, right? And, and, and on point with it and necessary. And um, I thank the most high for you, my brother. If there's anything that I can do to assist you, let me know. If you ever like to feature on my platform as well, uh, let me know. Um, and um, if anybody else wants to follow me, uh, you can find me as Divine Prospect on Facebook, Divine Prospect on Twitter, at Kingdom Moments on Instagram. That's one word, Kingdom Moments, at Kingdom Moments. Um, you can also follow me on my Patreon, where I have a lot of exclusive information, books on there, uh, giveaways, access to Bible tools and language courses, et cetera, is on the Patreon, which is www.patreon.com backslash Divine Prospect. Um, and you can also find me now on Clubhouse at Divine Prospect, right? We're really uh, blazing trails over there um, on, on Clubhouse and really going to turn it up over there, you know, so we can... Uh, definitely educate our people with an additional platform to make them aware of things that are going on so they can make better choices and decisions in life. All right. And front, and front line, Judah, um, you know, and when this session is over, go back and check out the replay because we're, we're at the end right now. You can go back and check out the replay. Hopefully, you know, what you watch is able to bless you and empower you, edify you, and educate you in some way. And if it has been a blessing to you, please support my brother, Elephant Man Podcast. Uh, you know, follow him on um, you're on Instagram too, my brother, right? Yeah, I'm on Instagram. I think, I think we're friends on Instagram. Uh, support his, you have Patreon as well, right? No, I don't, I don't have a Patreon set up yet. You need a Patreon, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, support his uh, YouTube channel, um, and any other means of support because we need open platforms like this in order to disseminate this type of truth to our community. Right. It's, it's edifying. Mm -hmm. It's encouraging. It's empowering. And there's little to no bickering, arguing or uh, contention. So thank you for allowing me an opportunity, my brother. Much love to you and a success for your platform. And I'm here to support you if you ever need me. Shalom. Shalom, man. That's what's up, man. Elephant Man Podcast Network. Grown man conversations dealing with elephants in the room. Subscribe, like, share. You ain't subscribed, Jake? Go ahead and subscribe. And those find us on Facebook. Find us on Twitter. I don't like Twitter though, but you can go ahead <laughs> and then the face and this uh, YouTube and podcast. I mean, IG, go ahead and share that. And uh, we're going to be getting into some other stuff like that. And then we got the grow a grow culture, read what you sow, eat what you grow, a grow culture. You know what I mean? Because we got to be able to grow our own food. They're talking about uh, <coughs> it's about to be a famine and all that. Now, man, we're going to eat. Tell them, amen, we're going to eat. <laughs> so we're going to pull our resources together. We're going to eat. All right. Uh, shalom till next time. Blessings. Perfect.